Hi, my name is Jeremy. And I'm Tanya. We're the senior pastors here at Lifehouse Fellowship Church in Midland, Texas. We want to invite you to two incredible Easter services. On Good Friday, April 19th at 7 p.m., we'll have a night of worship. Ministry will be provided for infants through age five. And Sunday, April 21st, we'll celebrate Easter at 10.30 a.m. We'll have special music and ministry for all ages. You know, I want to say this to you. Come experience, come expect it, and come on home to Lifehouse Fellowship. careful we remember people in a time when they were growing before they really got strong and we won't let them ever be what we think they could be and God is in the business of enabling us to see potential in people people that the rest of the world has given up on and can I tell you this when those people come into our midst and they get around us if we have given up on them entirely they feel it and you don't even have to say anything and that's why a lot of people hate church because when they go to church they can feel the disapproval of the holy ones and I don't think Jesus was that way I think people who were sinners felt comfortable in his presence but realized they needed to make some changes can I get an amen? Hi guys, I'm Jeremy Sutton and I host a ministry for men called Fireside Chat. We meet on the first and third Monday of each month at my house here in Midland, Texas. So I want to encourage you, bring something to throw on the grill. We'll provide the chips, the pico, the hot sauce, the guacamole, the sweet tea, and we'll just have a great time. And who knows, we might even have Miss Jeannie's famous banana pudding. So join me Monday night at seven o'clock. My name is Jessica Stanford and I host Real Women every second and fourth Monday of the month. I want to invite you to join a group of women who have made a commitment to study the Word of God together. 
We are real women who want to grow together, encourage one another, and be equipped to be all that God has called us to be. So please join us right here at 7 o'clock um, upstairs and bring a friend. guys, this is Pastor Jeremy Sutton here at Lifehouse Fellowship Church. We want to say thank you for tuning into our Facebook live feed and allowing us the privilege to come into your homes. What an honor it is. Hey, today, let us know how we're doing. Give us a thumbs up, throw some hearts out there, and if there's anything that ministers to you, would you just comment and let us know what God is saying to you and through you? We would certainly appreciate it. Well, I'm so thankful because God's got a word for you today. Welcome to LifeHouse. We are so glad that you were here and chose to worship with us this morning. How many of you know it's a good day to worship the Lord? 
Every day we wake up with breath and, and life in our body is a good day to worship him. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we just invite your presence here. Lord, we um, declare that you are great and you are greatly to be praised. And so this morning we set our heart, we set our attention, and we set our affections towards you. We say, come, have your way in this place this morning. May you be glorified and honored in all that we say and do. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Good morning and welcome to the Lighthouse. My name is Alex Sutton and these are your morning announcements. If this is your first time with us, please text the word welcome to the number 432-287-1030 and follow the prompts. You can also fill out a welcome card near you and take it to the Connection Center. Real Women Ministries meets the second and fourth Monday of each month upstairs at Lifehouse at 7 p.m. Join us Monday, April 8th for some real talk, real fun, and real prayer. We are honored to have Pastor Willie George ministering on Palm Sunday during the morning service. Invite friends and family and make plans to be a part of this very special weekend. Join us on Good Friday, April 19th at 7 p.m. for a night of worship. Ministry will be provided for infants through age five. Let's draw close to God as we reflect on all that he has done for us. We are so excited to host the Well Done Tour with Christian artists, the Afters, David Dunn and Jameson Strain. The concert is Saturday, April 27th at 7 p.m. We will need volunteers to help in a variety of areas. Please sign up at the Connection Center today.
The LHF Business Leaders Luncheon is Thursday, April 25th with Pastor Willie George, founding pastor of Church on the Move in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Lunch is provided and there's no cost to attend. Register today at lifehousefellowship.net. Lifehouse is going to Israel in March 2020. You still have time to join us. Information packets are available at the Connection Center, or you may visit with Pastor Jeremy for more information. Life groups are where faces become friends. Groups are happening throughout the month in Midland and Odessa. Pick up a directory at the Connection Center, or you can visit lifehousefellowship.net for details. In just a moment, we will receive our tithes and offerings. To give securely with your mobile device, text LHF to the number 77977 and follow the prompts. You can also go to lifehousefellowship.net or simply use an envelope provided on a chair back near you. The best way to stay up to date on the happenings at Lifehouse is the Lifehouse app. You can listen to sermons, check the events calendar, and so much more. Be sure to allow notifications so you can receive the latest updates from Lifehouse. Good morning, church. So good to be here with all of you today. Amen. This is one of my favorite days of the week, if not the favorite. It's even better than a day off, amen. To be with, to be with our church family, to be with people who love Jesus, come and get encouraged in the corporate atmosphere where his anointing is there. It just gives us a boost, gives us a wind in our sail, amen. It's so good. So I'm glad, I'm glad to be here with you today, amen. I just want to encourage you from the word this morning as we prepare our hearts to give. Um, I know that this is a body of believers that um, is not shy on giving. Giving of your time, giving of your resources, um, giving of your, your heart, your love, taking meals to people in need. So I know I'm talking to the choir today, but um, we all, if you're like me, need help, need uh, help with our patience. Patience is a virtue. I was raised to know that. I will go ahead and confess right now it is not my strongest virtue. <laughs> and I'm hoping I'm not alone in that today. But praise God for the word that it uh, shows us how we can grow in it. And the scripture that's been going over in my heart, as I've been pressing in in a more intentional way, um, over the past few months, I'll say, I've been, I mean, we all have things that we're standing in faith for, that we're trusting God to do in our lives, in our families, in our homes, um, whatever the case may be. So I'm, I'm sure there's, an, there's a varying difference of things that everyone is, is trusting God for, looking to God for, using your faith and saying, God, I'm trusting you here. I've got no other way. And so the Bible says in Hebrews that we have need of endurance. And that word endurance is also patience. We have need of patience. You know, we live in a fast-paced world, don't we? Where everything is now, now, now. And if Chick-fil-A doesn't get it to me in six minutes, I'm a little ticked because that's why I came here. Because <laughs> they're good at it. But um, when we are walking with the Lord and we're calling for things to come from the unseen into the seen, Time is not the issue. Our faith is. And we must stand strong, amen? And we must have patience and we must have endurance. I've been talking with some of my coworkers even just this week uh, about this very thing. It's not sometimes that our faith isn't strong enough. It's that we have need of endurance. And Hebrews 10, 36, if you've got your Bible app open there, if you just want to quickly look at it, um, I'm just going to read it from the Amplified, preface it really quick. It says, for you have need of patient endurance, and why? So that you may receive and enjoy the full of what God has promised. I don't want to miss out on what God has promised me. All his promises are yes and in Jesus Christ, amen. Amen? And we can see God's word come to pass for us and bring in from the unseen to the seen. We'll see bits and pieces here. But I have had the Lord just really encourage me over the last few months don't stop there. Keep expecting. 
Keep expecting. Well, if I'm going to keep expecting, I'm in need of endurance. I'm in need of patience. Lord, help me to stay the course. And that's why I can say this is my favorite place to be is with right here with God's people. Because we come into this corporate anointing, this atmosphere where we've all come together in faith. And it lifts us up. And I, I, I'm, I'm lifted up way more than I am just all by myself. Amen. How many of you can attest to that? You just feel, like I said, that wind in your sail to keep on, to keep pushing. Because patience is not sitting on my hands. Well, I'm just waiting on God. If it's faith and patience together, there's action in that patience. Amen. And, and I was thinking about what that, you know, being able to articulate, what is that patience? What is being in faith and patience, as it says in Hebrews 6, 10, or 6, 12, faith and patience inherits the promises, God said. So I want to find out, I'm, I'm standing on God's word for his promises. I'm in need of endurance. I'm in need of patience. And so what does that look like if I'm going to see those promises? If I'm going to receive them from the unseen to the seen, I'm going to come in here with a heart of praise because I've got a reason to praise him because he's given me promises and he is not a man that he should lie and those promises are coming to pass in the name of Jesus, amen? We keep a thankful heart. That's the second thing we can do. Keep a thankful heart. God, I'm thankful for how far you've brought me. God, I'm thankful for what you have done. I'm thankful for this. I'm th but there is more. You told me to expect, so I'm expecting. But maintain that thankful heart in the process. And number three, keep God's word before your eyes, not the circumstance. Because it can look like there's no change. But we're not moved by what we see when we're hooked up with the anointed one and his anointing. We see it the way he sees it, amen? So let's just, I just want to encourage you right now as you're getting ready to worship him with your tithe and your offering. And we're getting ready to go into more praise and worship as we get ready for the ministry of the word today. Just lift your hands and say, God, I'm so thankful. And I'm here because I know that I have great, exceeding, precious promises that are promised to me. And I worship you today because I know they're coming to pass in my life in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for the privilege of being here today with people of like and precious faith. Thank you, Lord, that we are called to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. So we today step out in faith. We came to this place in faith, God. And we thank you that you give us everything that we need to be able to continue to stand. And having done all to stand, we will stand. We will continue to thank you. We will continue to praise you. We will continue to keep our eyes on Jesus. Because we know that your promises are coming to pass in our life. And you want us to enjoy the fullness of all that you've promised us as your kids. We love you today. And we worship you with our tithe and our offering now. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. worship you. We exalt you. You are worthy and you are welcome in this house. Come 
become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness, Lord. Just stay right there. As I was praying this morning, I became very aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when we sing this song, it's a moment that you and I have to be in his presence. And he gives us moments like this, not so we can just go through the motions, so we can truly experience the presence of God. And this is an opportunity for you to experience his presence. So what I'd like to do is just sing that part again and into the chorus. And I really want us to think about and posture our hearts in a way that says, God, I want nothing more than to experience your presence. Right now, in this moment, in this hour, I believe I have a word for you this morning that also takes this moment and it amplifies as we come into the Easter holiday to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, will you take a moment and posture your hearts as we sing this one more time. Just posture your hearts and say, Lord, I desire nothing more than to be in your presence this morning because we need him here, amen? We need his presence to fall upon us. Let's sing that again. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of Worthy. You are worthy. Jesus. 
Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Go ahead and get out your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians. Thank you, worship team. They'll be coming back up here in just a moment uh, at the end of the service. And so we're not done worshiping. Amen. Well, I have a question for you this morning, and the question is this, what's the difference between the bird flu and the swine flu? Well, one requires tweetment, and the other requires ointment. <laughs> uh, I couldn't figure out uh, why the baseball kept getting larger, then it hit me. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you need, you need a little laughter this morning. Why are frogs always so happy? Because they eat whatever bugs them. All right, that's enough of the corny jokes. I'm excited about this morning. I've titled my message, A Table for Two. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll get to the text momentarily. First, I want to say it's an honor to get to be in this pulpit this morning. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and Tanya are... Uh, just having a moment of getaway just to relax and refresh and rejuvenate. So pray for our pastors. Aren't we blessed to have such wonderful pastors? Amen? Yeah. And so when they are gone, we do miss them. Um, and so pray for them. Uh, pray for their safe return. And then uh, pray that they come back uh, revised and rejuvenated. Amen? So I'm, I'm honored to get to be here to minister to you today. And going into the Easter holiday, we do celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I felt like this was a moment to get to teach on communion. And that's why this is called the table uh, for two. And so we're going to talk about communion today. Have you ever thought, what's the value of communion? We may know what it is. We might, not, uh, we might know that we take the bread and we drink of the cup. And we know it's to remind us of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we may not understand it fully. I want us to understand that communion is priceless. Say priceless. And you can't understand or see the value, uh, the value of this until you begin to understand why Jesus instituted this practice for us and what it meant to him and what it meant to the church throughout history. It's easy to allow this moment to just be something for our carnal remembrance because Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. And that is just supposed to be something that we just remember and recall in our minds. It can become so routine or ritualistic that we miss opportunities for Christ to reveal himself to us. And Pastor Chad Sykes said, I have become very convinced of the real presence of Christ in communion. Today, we are going to look briefly at the history of communion. Then we are going to answer the question, is communion a symbol? We'll also answer the question, is communion more than a symbol? And finally, we'll take a look at your part in communion, and we will and we will end today with us taking communion as a church family. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this moment. I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that I get out of the way of what you want to do this morning and what you want to speak to us. May I simply be a vessel, emptied of myself, but full of your presence. Holy Spirit, help me to articulate every word that comes from my mouth. And I pray that the seed sown today would fall on ears that hear and hearts that receive this morning. So, Father, we thank you for this time of worship and that it prepared our hearts to receive the seed that will be sown this morning. You are welcome here, and we thank you for your presence. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. The Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, breaking of bread, and Holy Communion. Depending on your church background, you may be familiar with any of these terms that define a moment of remembering what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. 
The Eucharist in the biblical text is a Greek word, Eucharisteo. And when the word says he broke the bread and gave thanks, that Greek word is Eucharisteo, which means thanksgiving. And how many of you know when we take communion and we partake in communion that we are giving thanks for what Jesus did for us on the cross? Amen. Now let me give you a little bit of history. Because we're about to read in 1 Corinthians a strong rebuke from Paul. And uh, as I read through that, I was like, why would he rebuke them for just taking uh, a little wafer and a little bit of juice and make a big deal about getting drunk and debauchery and cutting up and all this kind of stuff? I was like, why, why would Paul rebuke them over this little bitty thing? And then I realized there's probably a little more to it. So let me give you a little, a little church history here. Early Christians celebrated the Lord's Supper as a full meal. And by the third century, it had ceased to be a banquet and had become a ritualized small meal instead. Christians usually gathered in individual homes for a communal evening meal to commemorate the Lord's Supper. And although these meals generally fostered community, they sometimes led to disagreement, discord, and debauchery. How many of you have ever been at a family meal or a get-together where there was a little bit of disagreement going on? <laughs> How many of you know that happens Thanksgiving Day? <laughs> Early Christians participated in meals characterized by inclusivity, care for one another, and unity. But as Paul's letter indicates, these idealistic practices as the Lord's Supper sometimes became abused because Christians either practiced Jewish purity laws at the table, meaning they were trying to decide what foods were appropriate to consume, okay, so they were kind of going back and forth, or they transformed the meal into a gathering modeled by Greek and Roman banquets by drinking too much wine. So misuses of the Lord's Supper factored into communion becoming more controlled and structured in the Christian church. Communion became less of a meal together to more of a, real, a, a ritualistic um, or kind of a moment of communion that we see today. So something like this or something where a priest will bless the, uh, the bread and bless the wine before taking communion. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, the very word communion implies being with someone. The word means having in common a partnership, a fellowship recognized and enjoyed. Communion is related to the words common and communication. And we must see that having communion is more than eating a little wafer of bread and drinking a little cup of juice. It is a table for two, which is what I've got up here. It is a place where all natural, uh, I'm sorry, it is a place where you and Jesus can fellowship together in remembrance of all that he has done for you. It is a place where you can celebrate all the benefits provided for you by his shed blood and broken body. So communion is a time for you and Jesus to sit at the table and for you to remember what Jesus did for you on the cross and to to commune with each other. You were created to commune with Jesus, to have a conversation with him. It's not just a one-sided relationship. It is a moment for you to get to know the king. But it is also a table for all. And I don't, is the, um, do you have that one slide that has a table for two? And it is also a table for all. It is a place where all natural barriers cease to exist. It is a place where we recognize, honor, and respect all others who are part of the body of Christ. It is a place where we acknowledge and give thanks to God for what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. You see, it's a banquet table as well, where all are welcome. Remember the last supper where the 12 disciples sat at Jesus' feet? So it's not only a table for two, but it is also a banquet table. Now, it would be easy to to look at the elements of communion, these things, and to, to simply think that this is simply food and simply drink. Individuals might think that it's nothing deeper or maybe not even having meaning or significance. 
But I want us to reevaluate what we believe and what thoughts we have about this moment when we take communion. That it's more than simply food and more than simply drink and that something more is going on. And luckily, we have several instances in Scripture where this thought is addressed that it's just simply a cracker, that it's just simply some juice or wine or a wafer. And Paul addresses that because many times we can get to that place where it becomes routine and, oh, we're taking communion again today. And we miss the significance and the value that communion has. Now, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to be in verse 17. And here's what I need you to understand. Paul is very frustrated, and rarely do we see uh, Paul in Scripture as frustrated as he is uh, in this, in this uh, moment as he's addressing the church. In verse 17, Paul says, But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. I'm not going to praise you. I'm not going to give you props. I'm not happy with you. He said, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now skip over to verse 20. He says, therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Now this is Paul saying, what? So the writer makes point to put an exclamation mark behind this. So this isn't a like, what are you doing? This is like, what? What the heck is going on? Paul's frustrated here. He said, look, I'm not going to give you props. I'm upset with you. And now you're coming together and you're getting drunk. You're not serving one another. You're serving yourself. Do you not have houses in which you eat or drink? Or do you despise the church of God? And shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. Now, Paul addresses the church, but why is he frustrated? What's the significance? What's the big deal going on here? Now, I want you to turn over to John because here's what you need to understand. This is why, this is why Paul's frustrated. Jesus speaks this, verse, uh, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 6, and we're going to be in verse 53 and verse 54. And Jesus therefore said to them, now there's a, there's a crowd here, the 12 disciples are here in the crowds here. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you here. If I was on the fence about my relationship with God, a statement about eating someone's flesh and drinking their blood might kind of wig you out a little bit, right? Would you agree? Well, it wigs some people out. Now, not the 12 disciples, they knew what he was talking about. They had a revelation. They understood who he was. They understood where he was coming from. That it was, there was significance behind what he was saying. But there were other disciples in the crowd that left. And they never came back to him. You can read that further down in chapter 6. They left and they never came back to him. Now, now look. Today, you might be struggling a little bit with this teaching, and it's okay. It's okay to wonder and try to question what is actually taking place in this moment because you might be surprised as I was that Jesus didn't go running after those people who left. He didn't say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I, maybe, that's, maybe I said it a little wrong. He didn't go running after them. 
Let me address a doctrinal statement real quick. Some of you who maybe, based on your church background, might be more familiar with this doctrinal statement. And I'm about to make, or maybe you've studied this subject on communion a little bit. But the statement is this, that a certain moment, the priest blessed the bread and blesses the cup, that at that moment, it physically becomes his body and physically becomes his blood. Now, this is a doctrine that is prevalent in some denominations, and so I want to address it because you might be saying, okay, well, what do we believe here at Lifehouse Fellowship, this moment that we partake in communion? We do not believe in this doctrine because we do not find it in Scripture. I don't find it in Scripture that there's a certain moment when a priest or someone can bless the wafer or the bread or bless the cup and that it becomes physically, becomes his body, and it physically becomes his blood. So I say it this way. We don't have a right to say that he's not present in the Eucharist or in communion because he said that he was. But at the same time, we don't have the right to say how he's present in communion because he never told us how he was. We can't take it that uh, that blood, we can't take it that, that far and say that we know that it physically becomes his body or that it physically becomes his blood, but we can certainly say that he is present in that moment because he most certainly said that he was. We can certainly believe that he is there in this very spiritual way that he shows up in this moment that he is there and present with us. And listen, that shouldn't be very hard for us to believe as believers. When we take communion, that he is present with us. Now, I'm perfectly happy to say that his, his being present is a mystery. Would you say that during worship, when we raise our hands and we surrender and we sing songs, that that is something very physical that we're doing, but in that moment, he shows up in a spiritual way? Would you agree with that? In the Eucharist and communion, when we do this very physical activity, he shows up in a very spiritual way, and if he is there in that He's present in that moment that he wants to do mighty and miraculous things. So I want to ask you, I want to ask and answer three very important questions about communion today. And the first thing is this, number one, is communion a symbol? Is communion a symbol? Well, it's simple. Yes, it is it is a symbol. It symbolizes his death and resurrection. You see, the, the breaking of bread, this cracker symbolizes, and when we break it, it symbolizes that his body was broken for us. And the holes in the cracker represent the holes in his hands and his feet and his side. And the crackers got a little bit of burnt to it. And those burned places on the cracker represents that he was bruised for our iniquities, that he was bruised for our transgressions. And this juice that we drink, it represents the blood that was shed for you and I. And the blood that was poured out for us. So yes, is communion, is, uh, is, is it symbolic? Yes, it's, it is symbolic. And certainly communion is a symbol, but how much weight it carries with you should matter to you. Now, if a stop sign was down on the ground and you came up to the stop sign, would you go and pick up that stop sign and put it back in place? Many of us would not. 
because we don't really care. We either know it's a stop sign and we got to look all ways or we just plow right through it. But many of us wouldn't take a moment to pick up the stop sign. But the stop sign symbolizes something, doesn't it? What does it symbolize? Stop. Now, on the contrary, if we came up to that same stop sign and we saw an American flag that was on the ground, many of us would stop and pick that up. We would dust it off, fold it back up, or give it back to the owner because we know that it symbolizes something of value. And I know in our country it's a tough subject right now, but I'm telling you, it symbolizes something of value, that men and women died for our freedom so that you and I could be sitting in this place right now. The flag symbolizes, and it has weight, and it has meaning, and it has value. So we take communion in a very sacred and special way because we can remember that there was someone who died for you so that you and I could have freedom of eternal life. Amen. Amen. So to the question, is communion a symbol? Yes, it most certainly is. And to the next question, number two, is communion more than a symbol? The answer is yes. Excuse me. There's much more taking place in communion than just simply the bread and the cup. The Bible says people were dying and getting sick because of their misuse of communion. If it were simply a symbol, why would that be taking place in the church? People dying and getting sick. If all it was for was just to remember what Christ did, why do it at all? It is for here and right now. It was a sacrament that Christ gave us to intercede with us, to commune with us right there in that time and in that moment. That when we physically take him into our bodies, that he is there and he is present. His body and his blood enters into our bodies. And there are testimonies and stories from all over the world of people being healed simply by the act of taking communion. By bringing their faith to that moment and saying, God, you are here. And I believe you are a mighty, uh, that you do mighty and miraculous things, God. And that you still do miracles. And I believe you are here and you are present in this moment. Bill Johnson says this, sickness is to the body what sin is to the soul. Forgiveness of sin and healing for our bodies was paid for you and I at Calvary. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, and the amplified version says, by his wounds, we are healed. So it is more than a symbol. There is healing that can take place. Now, I read one, one testimony where a pastor taught on this and a lady went home, her husband was dying, and she went home and she force-fed him communion, shoved bread into his throat and made him drink the cup. She did it for about five days and she came back and her husband ended up dying. She comes back to the pastor and, and she's upset. She said, it didn't work for my husband. But can I tell you today that communion is more than a symbol Remember when I said it, when I said it's a table for two, it's an understanding of the Father. It's an understanding of what Jesus did for you. It's an intimate moment. And when you have understanding, you have revelation. And when you have revelation, then this moment becomes more significant in your life. Let me tell you a story about two gentlemen on the road to Emmaus. They were walking along on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus himself was with them. But they did not know that it was Jesus. 
Their eyes were blinded to the fact that it was Jesus and he walked with them. He taught them about the prophecies. He's taught them about scriptures. And in many ways, that's how we come to church. And we learn more about the scriptures and prophecy. And all these things we learn more about who he is. And sometimes he's here and we don't even know it. We don't even recognize that his presence is here. And I believe that he did this specifically after his resurrection so that we would know what exactly takes place in communion. So you'll remember as they were walking along, it was growing towards the end of the day, and Jesus was like, peace out, I'm out, guys. And they were like, no, 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 Jesus, come eat with us. We'll, bring, we'll come to our home and we'll feed you dinner. And so he did. Let's look at Luke chapter 24. If you'll turn there, Luke chapter 24. The Holy Spirit's about to give you revelation here. We're going to be in verse 30. And it came about that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Verse 31. So as Jesus broke the bread, he blessed it, and he gave it to them. Their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight. I love it. You see, I think this is a symbol for many times of the way that we are in the church, and we come in, and we hear the word, and it's good, and it feeds us, and we get to know more about Christ but it's in the moment of the Eucharist when we take the bread and it's blessed and broken. And in that moment, our eyes are opened and he is revealed to us. And in that moment, we know him in a way that we had no way of knowing him before. And this story is a symbol for what can take place when we interact with God in this way during communion. Amen? It's a revelation. Number three, what is our part? So you say, that's great, Matt. <laughs> that's good. But what's our part? What, what can we do whenever we come into this time of communion? So here's what I want to read to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn back over there. Have you gotten something so far? Okay. 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to look at verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of it, the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Say examine. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Now Paul says to examine ourselves. And in this, uh, in this text right here, it's, it's not examining yourself to see whether you've been good enough that week in order to take communion today. That mindset, you have to evaluate what you've done this week and what your sins are, and, and answer the question, am I worthy enough to take communion at this time with the body? I want to tell you that that type of teaching and thinking is completely wrong. Because if, if we are to come to this moment and evaluate whether we are worthy to sit at the Lord's table and to take his supper that he provides for us, I can tell you that beyond a shadow of a doubt, not one of us here is worthy to sit at the table. We must be invited to sit at the table. And at the church of Corinth, Paul explains what he means by examine yourself by using the exact same words in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. He says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. 
Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? And if you want to know how to examine yourself in this moment, it's to test yourself. To see if you believe that there was no way that you could have ever earned your spot at this table. It's to test yourself to see if you believe that it is only by the body and the blood of Christ that you were even allowed to come to this table and participate in this moment of communion. And in a moment, we're going to take communion together. Before, but before we do, I want to tell you a story. And as I tell this story, I want you to place yourself in this story. You imagine as you're driving down the road to work one day, and in a third world country far from here, there's a new strain of the flu that is very contagious. It spreads really quickly, and 4,000 people are infected with this disease. And the doctors have said that there is no cure for this disease, that it's something that spreads very quickly, and the most certain outcome you may live months, you may live years, but the most certain outcome of this disease is death. There's no way around it. The doctors have not discovered a cure. It begins to spread rapidly all around the world and eventually to different countries. And uh, different countries begin to close their borders because they don't want it to come into the U.S. And then one day you hear the news that there are six people in a New York hospital that have contracted this disease. From there, it spreads quickly, and within just a few mo uh, months, you yourself are infected with this disease, and everyone you know around you is probably most likely infected with this disease. And it seems to be spreading rapidly, and pretty soon you're wondering what it's go what's going on in the world, what's it doing to the world, and, and in that moment, because it spreads so quickly, we know that everything is going to die, but one day, good news comes. And they say we've discovered a way to make a cure for this disease. But the problem is we need one person, one person that's not affected with this disease. So we'd like for all of you to rush to the nearest hospital. And we're going to take a test and we're going to test everybody's blood to see if we can find one person that's not infected with this disease. You pick up your family and you rush to the hospital. And you get in line and they take a sample of your blood. And they tell you to go wait in the parking lot. Because we want to rapidly find out quickly, quickly if we can find a cure for this disease. And we want to know the results. So you go out and you wait in the parking lot. And you wait there for hours with nervous anticipation. Finally, the doors burst open from at the hospital. And the doctors come out with a megaphone. And he says, congratulations, we found someone who doesn't have the disease. And the crowd goes wild. And I mean, they're yelling, they're cheering, they're laughing. There's so much joy. And he says the name over the loudspeaker, we need so-and-so to come up here. And you're looking around. I didn't hear what he said because there's all this cheering going on. And he calls it again. We need so-and-so to come up here. And you're like, what did he, who did he say? And over the cheers, you can't hear. He says it a third time. And the third time, you feel a tug on your jacket. And you look down. And it's your son, your only son. And he says, Daddy, I need to tell you something. They called my name. And at that point, you pick him up and you rush him to the, the doors and you say, Doctor, here's the, here's the person you called. It's my son. He's the person that you've called. And he's, he, the doctor says, Great. We're going to take him back to the room and prep him. We're going to need you to fill out some forms. We need your release for your consent. But before we do that, I need to tell you something. And you say, sure, doctor, what is it? What's going on? He said, well, we've checked and your son is the only person in the whole wide world who's not infected with this disease. But we didn't expect it to be a child. And you, you, you'd say to the doctor, doctor, what, what does that mean? I don't understand. What, what are you talking about? And he says, I'm sorry, but in order to do this, we're going to need all the blood from your child, and he won't live through this. 
Doctor, how, how can I do that? How, how can I give up my only son? And he says, I don't know what to tell you. But just remember that it's for the life of the whole world. But there will be no one left if you don't make the sacrifice. Could you do it? Could you give up your own son, your one and only son, to save every random stranger in the world? Let's say that you did for a moment. And the doctor said, I'm going to give you a moment to go into the room and say your last goodbyes to your son. You go in there, and your son says, Mommy, Daddy, what's happening? Where are you going? What's going to happen to me? Why have you forsaken me? Let's say you did give up your son and the world was grateful for this and they said, you know, what we want to do is we want to have a memorial for your son, but not just one memorial service. We want to do it on a weekly basis. And on a weekly basis, we'll come together for this memorial service to remember his tragic death, but also to remember that we only have life because of his sacrifice. And so we'll mourn his death, but we will celebrate the fact that we have life because of this. And as a mother and father, how would you feel if over time people stopped coming to your memorial service? They say, I have more important things to do. My social life is very important. I'm very busy at work. Maybe you have some valid excuses of why you can't make it. And as a parent, you would say to them, do you not remember? You wouldn't be here if it weren't for the sacrifice of my son. The true part of the story is that every single one of us in this room was infected with a disease called sin. And the most certain outcome was death. And there was a father who gave his son for you, and there was a son who gladly laid down his life so that you could have eternal life. And it's the price that he paid for all of us. I'd like for the worship team to quietly come up. The ushers are going to pass out communion to you. And in a moment, we're going to take communion together. So I want you to hold on to the elements. We come into this moment of communion remembering and mourning his death, but celebrating the life that we have because of him. Knowing that there would be no other way for us to have life if it weren't for the sacrifice Jesus made for us. I want you as we sing this song that this is going to be a moment of prayer for you and for us to repent. To repent because we remember that there's no way that we could have earned our place at this table. To repent for being guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. And then I'd ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to show up. To take this moment and ask Christ to be present in this time of communion. That he would be here. And there might be an area or a way that you need Christ to show up in a mighty, miraculous way in your life. 
I want you to pray this. God, when I go into this moment of communion, I pray that you would do this and show up in a powerful and mighty, miraculous way and totally change the situation that I'm dealing with. So this morning, whatever need it is that you have today, I would like for you to bring this to this moment of communion. And I'm going to pray over the elements, a prayer of confession and a prayer of praying and blessing these elements. And then as we worship, I would like you to really enter into his presence and ask God to do something mighty and miraculous in your life. And take a moment to let the Holy Spirit nudge you about ways that you can surrender and ways that you can turn away from self-reliance and have total dependence on God bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with a whole heart or loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Father, we pray that you would show up in a mighty and miraculous way during this Eucharist and this time of communion. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship.
night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was handed over to suffering and eventually death, he, at the Last Supper, took the bread and he broke it. He blessed it and he gave thanks to the Father and he said, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. You may take the bread. Then he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for the sins of many and for the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the cup. Now, as I said just a moment ago, this time is for the mourning, the death of Jesus Christ, but it is also for the celebration of life that we have. So today, I would like for us to make a proclamation, a declaration that can be done right now. And I'm going to say three phases, uh, phrases, and I would like for you to repeat after me, but not with a small, ungrateful voice. But I'd like you to repeat after me with a powerful voice proclaiming his death and his resurrection and until he comes again. So repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ, has died. Christ, is, risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. Now let's give him thanks for that. Come on, give him thanks.
glorious day, Father. And Lord, we just proclaim thanks upon you, Father, that we don't forget your son and the life that he's given us, Lord. That as we go into this season of Easter, that we every day we're reminded of the, of the, of the life that you've given us, Father, of the sacrifice that you've taken for us. And that we are filled with joy because of it, Father. Not sympathy or sorrow, but we have joy to proclaim your name unto the whole world, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> what a happy day. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Um, if you are a first-time guest with us this morning, we just thank you for being with us this morning. We are very happy to have you here. Um, some announcements. Let me not forget, real women will not be meeting this Monday. So don't forget. Don't show up. You'll be alone. <laughs> Um, if you are interested in going to Israel in March 2020, you can grab a packet at the Connection Center to get for more information this week. Y'all, don't forget, I'm sure it's on your calendars, but next Sunday, Pastor Really George is going to be in the house. Yeah, <laughs> it's finally here. So, hey, y'all might want to come early to get a seat. That's what I'm going to do. Anyway, that's all the announcements this morning. So just remember, church, great days are here and greater days are ahead. You're dismissed.